In today's video, we're having a look at how to set up and create a DIY kiosk for Home Assistant. Check it out. What's going on guys, I hope you're all doing well. Just in case you were wondering what a smart home kiosk is, essentially it's an area or a device that we can use to just glance at information or even interact with and control our smart homes, all from a nice and convenient UI. You will have definitely seen little devices and touchscreens that can control and interact with individual devices or control scenes, but in our case we're going to be specifically looking at devices and setups that can control and view whole Home Assistant dashboards and Home Assistant controlled devices. The kiosk that we're going to be setting up and creating today is going to be utilising SunFounders TS7 Pro Raspberry Pi touchscreen kit and it's also going to be using a modified version of the DessertBot Raspberry Pi kiosk setup guide and I'll leave links for both of those in the description below. You don't have to have the TS7 Pro or the TS7 screen in order to complete this project as long as you've got a touchscreen that's compatible with the Pi and all importantly you can actually get a hold of a Pi then you should be good to go with this project. The nice thing about the TS7 Pro is that it's a modular kit that's been designed specifically for this type of project. However, there's plenty of other Raspberry Pi kits out there. So if you know of another good one, then let me know in the comments below or just tweet it at me at MarkWattTech. If you're interested in picking up one of the TS7 Pros, you can pick up a kit for around £75. Or if you're only interested in the screen, you can pick up a screen for just £62. If you're opting for just the screen itself, then you're going to just get a 7 inch capacitive touchscreen which features a resolution of 1024 by 600 pixels. You'll also get all the cables and connectors that you need to actually connect it up. But if you opt for the Pro version, which is the one that we're using in today's video, then you'll also get all of the mounting hardware such as the back in plastic, a camera mount, and you'll also get an upgraded screen which also features built-in speakers. If you're not interested in those built-in speakers and you happen to own a 3D printer, then you could save yourself a couple of quid here and just 3D print your own stand or your own mount. It is also worth noting here that with both of those kits, you do still need to supply your own Raspberry Pi, so depending on the Pi you get will depend on the additional cost that it adds to this project. There are still a couple of other little accessories that you'll need to get in order to complete this project, but this one's going to be down to your personal preference, so you're going to need to either get an SD card or an SSD, and if you do opt for the SSD, then you'll also need to get that USB to SATA connector in order to connect them up. For this demo, I'm going to be using an SSD and that USB to SATA connector, but again, this one's going to be down to personal preference. If you're also planning on using an SSD, you will also require an SD card in order to perform one small step. Final thing that you'll need to actually complete this build is just a power supply, and this one is also going to be dependent on whichever Pi you're using. I'm making use of the Raspberry Pi 4 and also the official Raspberry Pi power supply. And if you are currently watching along and you're thinking, wait, that's already over £100, I could just buy a cheap Amazon tablet or a cheap Samsung tablet and slap that on the wall with Home Assistant on. Well, yes, you could do that. But the idea with this one is it's more of a DIY approach. So you're going to have a lot more control and customization over this thing than what you're going to have with just one of those tablets. So for example, you could run additional services on this Pi that's running your kiosk and with that little touchscreen. So you could do things like, run a web server, you could run your own MQTT broker, or you could even do something crazy like run your own local voice assistant all on that little device and that's an all-in-one unit, something that you're not going to be able to achieve using one of those tablets. It's also super modular so maybe one day if you decide you want to add some speakers to it or a camera or maybe you want to add some batteries for portability or maybe you want to just swap out that touchscreen for a bigger one, maybe you want to go to a 24 inch touchscreen, you could do that. If you're using a tablet, then you're going to be restricted and it's not something that you can do. Let's have a quick look at what you get with the TS7 Pro kit then. Inside the box for the TS7 Pro, you'll find some handy colour printed instructions, the touchscreen itself, and on the back of the touchscreen, you'll find some header pins, as well as two speakers for the plain audio from the Pi. You'll also find a HDMI cable, a printed camera mount, a micro USB, some HDMI adapters, all of the screws to assembling everything, a screwdriver for assembly and finally the back in plastic. Assembling the TS7 Pro kit is a breeze and SunFounder provide everything that you need including all of the tools and a great set of instructions to actually build the device. If you're using the TS7 Pro kit then there's actually a slot for an SSD on that back mounting plate. So before we actually attach that plate we're going to need to write an image to our SSD. So I'm going to plug that into the computer now and open up the Raspberry Pi imager. If you're not familiar with the Raspberry Pi Imager, you'll find a link to it in the description below. 
but it's a free bit of software that you can download from the guys over at the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And it's a super quick and super simple way of just writing and flashing images directly to your SD cards and SSDs. Once we've got the Raspberry Pi imager open, we're gonna to need to choose an operating system to flash to our device. So I'm just gonna press choose operating system. And from here, I'm gonna select Raspberry Pi OS Other. And if we just scroll down a little bit in this list, we should find one for Raspberry Pi OS Lite 64 bit. So let's choose that. The next step in this flashing procedure is to choose the storage device that we're gonna flash. So if we select choose storage, we should see our device that's plugged in. So I can see my SSD here and I'm just gonna select it. Before we press right now, we just also need to make a couple of amendments to the config file. And we can do that by just pressing this little gear icon. The first setting that we're gonna modify is just the host name. So I'm gonna select the set host name button and I'm just gonna give my Pi a name. I've called mine Pi Touch, but you can name this whatever you want. And this host name can be used to actually SSH into the Pi. And speaking of SSH, that's gonna be the next setting that we enable. So if we tick the enable SSH button there, and with that enabled, we can just scroll down and we're gonna to need to set the username and password. So this is gonna be the username and password that gets used to log into the Pi. And for our case, it's gonna be what we use to SSH in. I'm just gonna stick with the default username there of Pi and I'm gonna give it a password. Next up, we're gonna configure the wireless LAN, so we're gonna select that. If you're planning on connecting the Pi using only the ethernet cable, then you can totally skip this step if you want. But here, you just need to provide the SSID of your network and its password. With both of those set, we can scroll down and we can set the locale settings. So I'm just gonna tick the box here. And for me, the time zone and keyboard layout are already correct, but if you wanted to amend those, you can do those here. Now that those options are set, we can press save. And finally, we can go ahead and press right. When you press right, you should get a prompt telling you that it's gonna wipe the drive. So just make sure that is the correct drive before you select yes. And if it is, press yes. The drive should then just start flashing. That should just take a couple of minutes to complete, but once it is complete, you can just remove your SSD from your machine. With your SSD removed from your machine, you can now plug in that SD card and we're gonna head back into the Raspberry Pi imager. From here, we're gonna choose choose operating system and we're gonna scroll down to misc utility images. With that selected, we're then gonna select bootloader and we're gonna scroll down and choose USB boot. We then just need to select our storage, which is gonna be the SD card, and then we can choose write. That should just take a second to complete, but once it does complete, you can remove it from your PC and you can insert it into the Raspberry Pi. With the SD card now in the Pi, you can plug the power into your Pi and it should boot up. If you happen to have the screen plugged in at this point, you should just see the screen appear all green, meaning that the EP-ROM update has completed. And if you haven't got the screen plugged in, if you just leave the Pi for a couple of seconds, then unplug it, you'll be good to go. Basically what that step does is it just tells the Pi it needs to first boot from a USB as opposed to trying to boot from an SD card. So if you're using a brand new Pi out of a box, this step would need to be done. But if you already had something set up, then you could have changed that bootloader in your Raspberry config settings. Now that the bootloader has been updated, we can remove the SD card from the Pi and we can then attach the SSD to the back of the mounting plate and wire it all up to our Pi. We should then end up with something like this, where the screen and Pi are attached with the back plate and also the SSD mounted to that back plate. Once we've got this, we can then just plug it in and let the Pi boot. As it's the first boot for the Pi, you may wanna just give it a couple of minutes to actually let it set itself up and register everything. But once that's all done, we should be able to directly SSH into it as we turn this on in the beginning. To connect to the Pi, we're just gonna be using the Windows command prompt as our SSH client. If you're on Mac or Windows, you can also just do this by using the terminal but we're gonna start typing a command and we're gonna type SSH. We're then gonna type our username. So in my case, I just left it as pi. So I'm gonna type pi followed by at. Then we're gonna write out our host name. So in my case, it was pi touch. And then I'm gonna put at local. With your one, you'll just need to configure this with whatever username and whatever host name you set. So it should be your username at the host name. With that typed out, you can press enter and it should prompt you for a password. And again, you're just gonna supply that password that you gave that user account that you created in the Pi Imager. If you're having issues connecting to the host name, then you can swap this out to be the IP address of the Pi. So in this case, you'd be using Pi at the IP address. Or if for some reason you forgot what the host name was, then you can just also look this up in the router settings and you should find the host name and the IP address for your Pi. Now that we're successfully logged in, we're just going to be typing in a bunch of different commands. And to make life easier for you, I will have all the commands and bits of code that you need all in the description below. So when you're down there copying and pasting it, don't forget to drop me a like. The first thing that we're going to need to do is just ensure that the Pi is up to date. So let's run some commands to do that now. We'll be starting with sudo app update and sudo app upgrade. And this is going to just run through all of those updates for us. It might take a couple of minutes if you're using a brand new Pi as it'll be getting all of the updates and all of the new packages.
Now that those updates have completed, we're just going to go into the configuration menu to modify some of the settings that are going to affect our screen. To get into this, we're going to enter sudo raspy-config and hit enter. That will then take us into the configuration tool. From here, we need to go down to option two, which is display options, and again, press enter. The first option in this list is D2 underscan, and we want to just press enter on that. And from here, we want to just set this to be no, so we're just going to press enter again, and then enter again. The next thing we need to check is just set the consoles automatically logging in. So if we head into system options here by again, just pressing enter, we're going to go down to option S5, which is boot auto login. And from here, we want to select B2, which is console auto login. And finally, hit enter again. We can now just navigate down to the bottom and we're going to select finish and when it prompts us for that reboot we're going to press yes. Once your Pi comes back to life we're going to need to reconnect to it and a super easy way of doing this without having to type the command out again is just by pressing up on the keyboard. That will then bring up our ssh command and we can just hit enter and then log straight back into our Pi. Now that we're logged back into the Pi we're going to run through some of the bigger commands. The first one that we need to install is just the minimum GUI components and this is going to allow us to run our browser on the Pi. Again, just directly copy and paste the commands from my GitHub and make sure you're copying and pasting them in the order that they're listed. For some of the commands, you'll get a pop-up saying, do you want to continue? And you just need to press the Y key and then hit enter. The next step is to install the Chromium browser, but by this point, I'm guessing you're up to date with the whole copy and paste the commands and run through them. With that installed, we're now going to modify the openbox auto start file and this is going to be ran on startup and this is going to affect what browser settings that we have. You can copy my settings directly, but if you want to tweak any of the startup settings or modify what Chromium is actually doing, then this is going to be the file that you're going to need to edit. So just paste in that command and hit enter. You'll then see all of the default config in that auto start file. So you want to just delete all of this out and then paste in my config. And with that config entered, you can hit control and X. It will then ask you if you want to save and if you press the Y key and then hit enter, that will then save that file for you. In that previous file we specified a kiosk parameter but we don't actually tell it what it is. So let's do that now and to do this we're going to modify the open box environment file. So again, enter the command and hit enter. And just like with before, we're just going to delete all of the default config out and we're just going to paste my config over the top. In that config you'll see a line that says export kiosk URL and it's this URL that the Pi is going to try and connect to when it boots up. So modify this here to be your home assistant IP address. Once you're happy with that it's going to be the same as before, we're just going to hit Control X, then press the Y key and hit enter. We're almost done now with the commands but the next thing we're going to need to do is to just ensure that that X server is running on boot. So let's do that now. We're going to first start by checking if our bash profile already exists. If the profile doesn't exist then all we need to do is just simply create an empty one and we do this by just using the same command but modifying it to be touch. With that file created we can use the nano editor and we can directly modify it. And with this one all we need to do is just paste in this one line of code and what this is going to do is it's going to remove that cursor and as we're using a touch screen we're not going to be bothered about seeing a cursor. With that entered again let's press ctrl x followed by y and enter. We can now run our final command and if this command runs successfully then we're going to be good to go and the Pi should automatically start in its kiosk mode. So let's paste that in now and hit enter. If your screen looks like this and you've got no error messages after that final command then you're going to be good to go. If you have got an error message then more than likely it's to do with a missing file or a missing repo so just double check that you follow through those commands in order and check that you've pasted in the config exactly as I have. If you've got no errors, just type out sudo reboot and reboot your Raspberry Pi. Once your Pi reboots, you should hopefully be greeted with the Home Assistant login page. Now we are going to run into a very small issue here and it's the fact that there's no on-screen keyboard so we can't actually enter the credentials. There are a few ways to get around this but we're just going to go with a nice and simple way and we're just going to plug a keyboard in. We can then enter our credentials and we can tick the little box to say keep me logged in and that's going to handle this every time the Pi reboots so this should just be a one time thing that we need to actually use a keyboard here. So enter your credentials and go ahead and log in. At this point now you should have a little Pi kiosk that will just automatically load up whatever URL you gave it. In our case it was our home assistant URL but if you wanted to be a bit more creative you could specifically create a dashboard that's designed around the whole kiosk green space and you can have it point to that so it will always open up your kiosk page. 
You can use this kiosk now to interact with and control all of your Home Assistant dashboards. But what's great about this is the fact that it is running on that Pi. So it's very modular and if we wanted to, we could run additional services on this thing, which can also help complement and support Home Assistant. Another handy little tip for using the kiosk and Home Assistant is to create a user account specifically for that kiosk. You can then sign into the kiosk using that account and that way any interactions or changes that are made through the kiosk will all be tracked back to that user in Home Assistant. Another very simple one is to just have that sidebar always collapsed if it's not in use. That way you get a bit more horizontal screen space but if that's not enough for you you could also check out the kiosk mode integration through the hack store. This will allow you to also hide that top menu bar and automatically hide the sidebar giving you that full screen effect for your kiosk. If you'd like to see some of the other kiosks or wall panels that I've used and how I've created my dashboards then let me know in the comments below and I may cover that in a future video. Before I leave you to start playing with your newly set up kiosk, let's just cover some of the things that aren't so great about this kiosk. By itself, this whole DIY aesthetic doesn't look great and it's not something that you'd really put in a kitchen. But if you wanted to, you could 3D print an enclosure for it and just make it a little bit nicer. I've personally been using this on my desk for a few weeks and I don't mind the aesthetic of it, I think it looks quite cool. It also depends on which options you've used and how you configured yours. So if you're using an SSD, then more than likely you're gonna have a cable sticking out the top unless you're using a smaller flat ribbon cable, or if you're making use of an ethernet cable, you might just have an ethernet cable hanging out of it. If you wanted to improve the portability of this kiosk, then you could always add a battery pack to it. And if you happen to buy that TS7 Pro kit, then there's actually already a slot specifically for a battery. Some of the other disadvantages for this kiosk is there's no power management. So it's either always on or always off. We also turned off that screen blanking right at the beginning so the screen doesn't even dim or turn off so if it's on then it's going to be full power and it's going to be like this all the time. As a workaround for this what I've actually done is I've combined it with some automations and also with some occupancy sensing in my office. So if I'm not in the office and I haven't been in there for a set period of time then a shell command gets sent to the Raspberry Pi and it will just automatically shut down that Pi. After the Pi is shut down, it will also wait a couple of seconds, and then after waiting for a few seconds, it will turn off the smart plug that I've got connected to the Pi. Then if I come back in the room, if it's in between a set period of time, so I think it's like 10 a.m. in the morning and 11 o'clock at night, then the Pi will actually automatically turn on by turning on the smart plug. The reason I'm not just combining the occupancy sensor directly with the plug and having the plug just turn on and off is because that turn off is going to be an instant kill and I don't want anything to get corrupted. And there we go guys, that's been a quick look at a Raspberry Pi kiosk setup for Home Assistant. If you have enjoyed this video then don't forget to drop me a like and if you're not already, hit that subscribe button and ding dong the notification bell, you'll then be alerted to any future video that I do. A massive thank you to these awesome dudes. These awesome dudes are my Patreons. If you're interested in helping support my channel, which in turn allows me to create videos like this, then you'll find a link to my Patreon in the description below. If you want to take your kiosk game to the next level, then you should definitely check out this video just here on how to turn your kiosk into a smart home alarm system. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.